So this is my presentation on uh, the 9-11 Truth Movement. I titled it, 9-11 was an inside job. Uh, the discursive opportunities and obstructions for the 9-11 Truth Movement by me, Richard G. Yellowfritz, PhD student, Oklahoma State University, today, April 17, 2012. Okay, so uh, only one other social scientist has done any uh, empirical or theoretical work, and this is Laura Jones. It's very recent work, so I uh, use her statements because I concur. The 9-11 Truth Movement is the umbrella term for a coalition of individuals based both in the U.S. and abroad who promote the belief that the U.S. government was to some degree involved in orchestrating the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, which we'll refer to as 9-11, in order to justify a subsequent course of action including the Iraq War and curtailing of civil liberties in the U.S. In her uh, later work, she followed up on the truth movement and uh, stated that the 9-11 truth movement are a particularly multifaceted example of how conspiracy can be practiced in contemporary society, having developed an online presence incorporating hundreds of individual and group websites, discussion forums, listservs, blogs, internet radio channels, downloadable films, and online journals through which conspiratorial imaginaries are circulated, debated, and modified. So these kind of encompass what I'm thinking are the discursive opportunities for the 9-11 truth movement. All of these things that I just read, the internet radio, the internet films, the uh, discussion forums, but she also notes something else and uh, about them. She says, this fluid network is at the same time grounded through particular offline locations as members of the 9-11 truth movement have employed more traditional forms of street protest and stage conference events. Uh, so she has actually worked in a similar way that I have, or I should say I have to her, as actually going to New York and Ground Zero and attending uh, the 9-11 truth protests or um, gatherings in which they uh, make their claims about 9-11 to the public at large. Uh, I went online uh, following her work because she's uh, noted the several uh, social movement organizations, which she doesn't frame as such, uh, but I found 15 social movement organizations related to 9-11 Truth. Anything ranging from uh, actors and artists to uh, medical professionals to pilots and scholars and scientists. Uh, one thing that I would like to do is on their websites, they oftentimes have the amount of people who have signed the petitions, which would indicate some, some type of uh, frequency of affiliation or membership. But what I did here uh, was I found the various Facebook pages and uh, uh, Facebook pages and groups, and their associated um, membership or things that you, that you like. So we see that architects and engineers for 9/11 Truth, which is one of the um, oftentimes referred to uh, social movement organizations of the Truth Movement, uh, has 82,000 members the most. Uh, the 9/11 Truth Movement page has 37,000 members. The, the um, group with the lowest amount of members is the U.S. Military Officers for 9-11 Truth. And these kind of bring about questions to me about the movement itself. Are there only officers of the U.S. military? Are there only U.S. military personnel a part of this movement who have liked this page and things like this? Or are these open groups? So how do we, how do we know who are a part of these social movement organizations and so forth? So those are some uh, broader empirical questions for this research. Another empirical question I came up with is I searched out what I thought of uh, as being oppositional groups in the 9-11 Truth Movement, and I only found one, and it was a page for the book, Debunking 9-11 Myths, Why Conspiracy Theories Can't Stand Up to the Facts, and it has fewer people who like that than there were at the, at the uh, group who had the least amount of likes for the truth movements. And so, you know, I'm, I'm asking questions about what this means for uh, the truth movement. Is the, is the truth movement the dominant uh, discursive a group for 9-11 for on Facebook, or do people just not see it as legitimate? Do people just not see it as something that they need to make, uh, you know, 9-11 debunking pages and then have, and then try to recruit people to that? So those are further questions that I have that um, can't be answered yet, but the fact that these pages exist, that these social movement organizations exist, indicates some type of discursive opportunity structure. So, uh, getting on to the 9-11 Truth Movement and who they are and what they do, uh, the reason that I titled my presentation 
9-11 was an inside job is because that's one of their overarching master frames that unites these social movement organizations, but it's not their only one. They also oftentimes refer to investigating 9-11, either through a new investigation or an independent investigation, and so that's why I'm treating uh, these two uh, frames as the master frames. 9-11 was an inside job, or investigate 9-11. Uh, as I witnessed myself when I was down at Ground Zero, and as you can see when you bring up uh, videos that they'll put out on the internet, you can see these phrases on their t-shirts, on signs, they're oftentimes on the um, like billboards and their websites and things like this, and so these are, these are floating out there, these are, these are um, phrases that they often use, and you can often see. Um, I googled the term 9-11 truth movement, and the top non-paid, non-advertisement uh, response was the was 911truth.org. Um, I clicked on it. The home page has been updated uh, on April 10th, and this was uh, yesterday. And I checked it again today, and so it indicates recent activity. The home page is, is basically dedicated to investigative journalism. And when I went to their about page, which hasn't been updated for uh, eight years, which makes me wonder about the activity, the the upkeep on these websites, and, and things like that. Um, they they had as their their kind of mission statement. Um, these, uh, these six phrases, four of which I provided here. So their top one is to expose the official lies and cover up surrounding 9-11. That gets back to our master frame. If, if the official lies uh, 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 are just that official lies, then that indicates that there's some type of cover up or maybe inside job, but at least that they need to investigate 9-11. Uh, their next one is to promote the best in investigative reporting. That's what I saw on the homepage was a series of investigative journal artists, not, not necessarily related to 9-11, but about issues which, if you believe that 9-11 was an inside job and things of that nature, then you might also suspect other ongoings of uh, large-scale institutions in society. So uh, another thing that I noticed on this website was they had a series of achievements, and one of them was that they, they believe that one of their achievements is to, uh, issuing this Zogby poll, and they say, thanks to the Zogby poll, 911truth.org was able to show that the numbers of people harboring well-justified doubts about the official story are growing, and that 911 truth is a mainstream position. So I went and I checked their Zogby, Zogby poll numbers, and uh, I found uh, this statement, and this is the way it's presented on the PDF. And so they, they asked this question about the US government and its 911 commission either covering up or not covering up, and they're, they're showing that 42% of people who took this poll, this is a Zogby poll, so this is professionally done, 42.3% believe that the U.S. and 9-11 Commission were covering up its, the investigations, whereas uh, the majority of people did not believe that it was covering up, but this is where they're getting this idea that it's a mainstream idea to believe that there is some type of cover-up. A uh, 10th anniversary poll by um, IBOPE, uh, Zogby, uh, was it more of an attitudinal poll and less of a belief poll? But it is indicating that cur that currently 58% of people agree that the U.S. Uh, investigation has been uh, of 9/11 is, is fully done. With that, about a third of people believe that there's that it hasn't been fully done. This, you know, I, I'm not really sure if you can compare these belief and attitudinal uh, accounts of it. Uh, but this kind of harkens back to the, the fact that they haven't updated their About Us page in eight years, and so they're saying that the, that the, you know, the 9-11 uh, master frames are, are, are mainstream, and I'm wondering if they're currently mainstream because we're only showing 33% of people. But still, a third of people who question the cover-up is still uh, not a small minority of people. So uh, these beliefs, the fact that there are either mainstream beliefs that 9-11 was, the investigation was covered up in some way, or if a third of people don't agree that it was fully investigated, we can, we can say that these beliefs constitute a part of, our, of the discursive field that the 9-11 truth movement will be operating in. And that in the discursive field, there are cultural materials such as values, beliefs, ideologies, myths, language, uh, that operate for people to transmit ideas, to communicate, to protest. But they're also stakeholders, so real people, the social movements, the, uh, the movement targets, and things of that nature. And so the discursive field is what, is what comprises the discursive opportunities and obstructions. And I'd just like to make a point, I'm not going to read everything on the slides that's there to um, answer any questions or fill in any blanks. But getting on the discursive opportunities, um, these are institutionally anchored ways of thinking that provide a gradient of relative political acceptability to specific packages of ideas. And so if, if we think about what the 9-11 truth movement are doing, we might think, not think that there are many political opportunities 
for uh, them to issue their master frames, that it was an inside job or that it was an investigation. Uh, but conspiracy politics exist, okay? The Project for the New American Century, which is a think tank that they cite often, is a big new Brzezinski, a former security advisor, uh, according to Laura Jones, uh, works by conspiracy theorizing in a legitimate sense. But uh, Jones's work in addressing the conspiracy theorizing in the 9-11 truth movement is, is asking, why is it that the 9-11 truth movement is seen as illegitimate, whereas other people in professional situations are seen as legitimate? And so there are opportunity structures politically for the 9-11 truth movement. Uh, one of the things that, that is uh, of concern to me is the hegemonic discourse that is a part of the political opportunity structure. And this is, I think, uh, something that, is, that we're gonna see as an, ups, an obstruction to the 9-11 truth movement. And so this is something that needs to be hashed out. And so I'm, I'm working with the uh, esteemed Dr. Shriver and teams uh, work on with with the term discursive obstructions, which they refer which refer to as the oppositional campaign waged by elite state and economic actors who use their power to mobilize public opinion against insurgent movements. Now this might be more of a political process theory, and so what I'm trying to do is incorporate uh, culture in uh, Armstrong and Bernstein's multi institutional context. So uh, Armstrong and Bern Bernstein propose that society is composed of, of uh, nested and overlapping institutions that are sometimes contradictory and sometimes reinforcing. So for instance, if the mass media reinforces official narratives from the Bush administration, then that's going to make it more difficult. It's going to obstruct the 9-11 truth movement. If there are contradictory institutions, such as independent mass media, where the 9-11 um, truth movement can uh, build their arguments, then that might be a contradictory location where they can um, uh, theorize what actually happened. So what, I, what I'm doing following Laura Jones is looking at the conspiracy theorizing done by the 9-11 truth movement as a form of popular knowledge construction. And I'm taking uh, also from, uh, from Spivak this idea of, this, of the subaltern. And this comes out of post-colonial studies. But the idea is that if conspiracy theorists are disadvantaged in society because they're marginalized, because they don't follow dominant frameworks of thinking or beliefs or values, then they actually have a marginalized or uh, 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 dominated or oppressed voice. And this is something that, that I want to look at further. Um, and we can actually see instances of discursive obstruction from elites that's, that's then talked back to by the subaltern. And this is the, this is the clip. George Bush, Bush of the United Nations telling the people not to tolerate anyone that investigates these facts. Let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories concerning the attacks of September the 11th. Malicious lies that attempt to shift the blame away from the terrorists themselves, away from the guilty. I guess it's un-American to investigate the facts. Okay, so literally you have a discursive obstruction from the president's mouth himself. And he chose to actually go after conspiracies about 9-11 and said, do not tolerate them. So that's a, that's a clear example. Other examples are from Cass Sunstein, who is now in the Obama administration, wrote an article about how to undermine the, specifically the 9-11 truth movement. Uh, and other uh, books have come out by Jonathan Kay. But to kind of talk about this idea of the subaltern talking back to uh, instances of discursive obstruction, uh, I think we need to look at some other instances where uh, this has happened. So in the feminist movements, for instance, where Fari talks about uh, radical voices, right? Radical voices that are radical simply because they don't resonate with a dominant discourse. And so I see that's what conspiracy theorists are doing. They're talking in a way about geopolitics Ticks, a critical geopolitical analysis in a way that is discursively obstructed by elites in society, supported by mass media. And so when we look at this, um, this non-institutional way of speaking, I want to look at it more as from an analytic point of view than an ideological point of view, and not immediately discount what these people are saying. So the discursive opportunities that Jones points out are the fact that the these people, like other United States citizens, have First Amendment rights of speech, of association and congregation.
but they also have mass and independent media. And there's academic settings in which people are now beginning to talk about this. And this comes through in Lance D. Haven's research of SCADs, which he considers political crimes, uh, which are state crimes against democracy. And they specifically address 9-11 as a state crime against democracy and do not approach this from the official version of the story. And so they, these are opportunity structures. But what I'm interested in more in today is the discursive obstructions. What, and what we have just seen from, from President Bush's uh, own words at the UN, but also um, is, uh, things like Popular Mechanics coming out with a book by Dunbar and Reagan, Debunking 9-11 Conspiracy Theories. This is a book published by the Hearst uh, publishing firm, which is a discursive obstruction. Uh, Sunstein, who I discussed, uh, was a uh, Harvard and Chicago law professor, now in the Obama administration, literally wrote a paper directed at the 9-11 truth movement to undermine them with uh, what he called cognitive infiltration. And then we have Jonathan Kay, who wrote a book called Among the Truthers, in which he uh, spent time speaking with people who consider themselves 9-11 truthers. But if you read his book, he approaches it from the outset, in the preface, literally saying, these people are crazy, and literally using that language. So what I'm, what I'm focusing on here, though, is what I think is a little bit more interesting, and this is the cons that, the, that the conspiracy discourse is bounded by a hegemonic discourse that other people are taking for granted, other social scientists. So Robinson did some studies on people posting in internet forums a month and a half after 9-11, and she only analyzed those who took a critical geopolitical analysis and talked about blowback from US foreign policy and those who adopted the Bush policy format. She didn't talk about conspiracy theories at all, even those those were developing at the time. Uh, Krebs and uh, Labaus uh, discussed the the um, anchoring of the, of the meaning of 9-11 and frame it in that way too, that 9-11 was either the, the official uh, narrative or uh, it was from the critical geopolitical stance, and uh, King and DeYoung do the same thing as well. And so I'm adopting Entman's cascading activation model, where we can hypothesize that the Bush administration formulated its official narrative, passed it on to other elites who, had, who pretty much had no other option. And that's what uh, Krebs and Labaus were, were discussing in their article, that other elites had no other option, and so the reason that the official story, that evil terrorists committed an act of war that must be met with a war on terror was adopted by other elites because if they didn't adopt that position, they would be ridiculed and stigmatized, much like uh, other people were. So here's what I'm saying: is that the Bush administration's official frame resonates and is uh, congruent with dominant culture and adopted as habitual because it's based upon long-established Orientalism and American exceptionalism. Uh, other frames that, that came out and contested this that said that 9-11 occurred because of blowback of U U.S. foreign policy, which the 9-11 Commission report actually came out and, and later said that one of the reasons uh, Osama bin Laden stated that he wanted to attack America was uh, U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East, our ties with Israel, our trade embargo and war in Iraq, things like this. But when people adopt this, and this comes out in the literature, these people are stigmatized, ridiculed, even by social scientists sometimes. So Robinson actually called these people anti-Americans. So what I'm saying is that Edmund sees this tipping point over here as things that are incongruent, that incongruent with dominant culture that become blocked. And that's where I see conspiracy theorizing at. And I think, uh, I think we can find a way to, to locate it, to actually see that that's where it's coming in. So. Uh, by analyzing Edmund's activation and congruence models in terms of the discursive location of the 9-11 truth movement, we can locate hegemonic discourse and better understand how power structures in society operate. If the claims of the 9-11 truth movement cross the tipping point, and the tipping point is where contradictions among dominant schemas start to become dissonant or perhaps too complex for most people to handle, and therefore call forth blocking responses, and I'll address these with Faree's work, uh, then we should see resistance and or repression from multiple institutions because I want to work from this multiple institutional paradigm. So this is this is it. How do we how do we see where the where the hegemonic boundaries of discourse are? How do we locate power in society? And you and you have to think back to Foucault that power is intimately related with knowledge, and that knowledge is a product of social interaction and in key parts through language. So what Faria is saying is that. Uh, when social movements are not directing all of their attention or most of their attention on the state, which, this, which the state would primarily, if it, if, especially if we're in authoritarian societies, which we're not, right, uh, it, it would use violence. But, when, but 
applying this multi-institutional framework to this, the 9-11 truth movement often say that there's a media cover-up, right? And that there's, that there's mass media involved in this. Uh, that there's other institutions involved. And so, uh, one of the other institutions I'd like to look at empirically is the treatment of conspiracy theories or uh, the 9-11 truth movement by uh, social scientists to see if there is some type of uh, backlash or, or hegemonic struggle for the narrative of 9-11. Um, so when social movements are not targeting the state, we'll see this form of soft repression, which Fury is saying comes in three forms. At the micro level in ridicule, where actually interpersonally people will resort, resort to calling names like tinfoil hat wearing conspiracy theorist and things like that. Um, at the more meso level, a stigma will arise about people. So a, a, a pejorative term, the truthers, has kind of developed out of the truth movement. And then what I've also seen is uh, other uh, institutional leaders literally engaging in discursive obstruction, let us never tolerate outrageous conspiracy theories, stigmatizing those things. And then uh, at the highest level of society, the broadest level, the macro level, she's proposing that uh, silence occurs. So if voice is, is what, um, for instance, in her case, feminist researchers are looking for in terms of the voice of, of women, where women were previously excluded from things like mass media, then the opposite is silence. And so what she says is that at the macro level, media norms about what deserves coverage and how stories should be told are part of what works to silence less institutional voices, which I'm considering the subaltern, indigenous knowledge work of conspiracy theorists, primarily those in the 9-11 truth movement. 